Marty McFly is a 17-year-old high school student whose best friend is a disgraced nuclear physicist. <laughs> and I sh** you not, they never explain how they became friends. I mean... They never explain it. And we were all fine with it. We were just like, what, who's his best friend? A disgraced nuclear <laughs> physicist. All right, proceed. <laughs> true, but I still love this movie. The truth is we actually know why Doc and Marty are friends. 2015 Back to the Future Untold Tales number one, Doc hires Marty to be his assistant after Marty tries to steal audio gear. That's why Marty uses the amp. I mean, I get it, no one reads the comics, but hidden at the core of Back to the Future is the real answer to the secret of Doc and Marty's friendship. But this movie ain't Back to the Future. Aha, uh -huh, I'm sure you super fans already caught it. This is actually the opening scene to Back to the Future part two, when they reshot the first movie's ending shot for shot replacing Claudia Wells with Elizabeth Shue. But before we start feeling bad for Claudia Wells, Claudia Wells was a recast from Melora Hardin, Jan from The Office, while Marty McFly was originally played by Eric Stoltz, who replaced the first choice, Michael J. Fox. Great Scott, what the hell was this movie? I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive, and we are blasting back to Back to the Future, the 1985 classic directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Zemeckis and Bob Gale. It is the seminal time travel film that gave us Avengers Endgame, Rick and Morty, theme park rides, a stage musical, snarky stand-up bits, and an unauthorized forkwill screenplay that I wrote that'll never get produced so long as the original filmmakers are still alive. Despite some goofy 80s camp, hey, incest, that's fun. Back to the Future remains a perfectly structured thrill ride. And the film holds up, not in spite of its cringe, but because the filmmakers knew exactly how horny and weird it is. Disillusioning the 50s and 80s for their buried moral filth is really the entire point. And despite its reputation as the best time travel movie, Back to the Future is not really about time travel. It uses time travel as a device to serve a simpler story in which a boy saves his father. To break down this father-son story, let's use the DeLorean's time circuit board. Act 1 in a 85, Marty's dad ruins his weekend. Act 2, 1955, Marty befriends his dad so that he can return home. And Act 3, back in 1985, Marty saves his dad. Yet truly behind the wheel is Marty's weird relationship with Doc Brown. Why are they friends? Well, we are gonna get to the bottom of the power of love. And the best way to support the Deep Dive channel is to grab some Deep Dive merch from nerdriot.shop like one of these Vosmonaut shirts. Or if you're Mr. Peabody, a space man from Pluto, you need to shoot before he runs over one of your pine trees. This film opens on, of course, clocks. All synchronized in Doc Brown's lab, set to 753, except for the one on the floor as Marty walks in, which is set to 818, the correct time, since the others are 25 minutes slow, as we learn later. My experiment worked. They're all exactly 25 minutes slow. Though the hour hand on that floor clock isn't where it should be. It could just be the clock is broken, but either way, our man Doc Brown has broken time. Everything we see in this opening take is foreshadowing everything that happens later in the movie. Like we pass one clock recreating Harold Lloyd's famous clock hanging scene from the 1923 silent film Safety Last, which Christopher Lloyd, no relation, reacts in the film's climax. The clock with the drunk appears alongside Leah Thompson's name as Lorraine has a drinking problem and it starts in her teenage years. There's a newspaper telling us that Doc's mansion burned down and his estate sold off, explaining how he got the insurance money to fund his experiments, the JVC camcorder Marty will use later, a news report about stolen plutonium by a Libyan terrorist group, and we initially only see Marty's feet. He rolls his skateboard and it bumps into the case of plutonium. The feet, the close-ups, and Marty from behind were all Michael J. Fox's stand-in. It's not actually Fox until he sits up in the rubble. I can roll. So why the stand-in on Marty's entrance? Well, a quick branch timeline on the insane casting drama of this film. Michael J. Fox was the Mechas and Gale's first choice for Marty McFly, a gifted physical comedian, but more importantly, Fox's role as Alex P. Keaton on Family Ties. Alex P. Keaton was a teenage conservative with liberal parents. He was the face of the resurgence of the political right in America when Ronald Reagan brought 1950s style conservative values back into the mainstream. Zemeckis and Gale, as kids who came of age in the late 60s, were caught right in the middle of these conservative decades and felt a disconnect from their parents. As an adult, Gail saw his dad's old yearbook photo and wondered if he and his dad would have been friends. Zemeckis always suspected his mom's moral scolding was hiding a more adventurous youth. When I was your age, I never chased a boy or sat in a 
parked car with a boy. Zemeckis and Gale had always wanted to do a time travel movie, but they fueled this vehicle with the emotional core of a kid feeling unstuck in time, struggling to relate to his parents. And so their goal with Back to the Future was to take the icon of 80s neoconservatism and throw him back to the 50s to expose how that era wasn't an American ideal. It was a scary, violent time in which even creative intellectuals were considered slackers. The issue was Michael J. Fox's schedule was tied up with family ties. So they ended up casting Eric Stoltz initially. He was a more dramatic actor and they shot five weeks with Stoltz until they realized he just was not fitting their vision. So they went back to the studio, increased the budget of the film by $5 million and reshot 35% of the film with Michael J. Fox in the role. That's how important he was to this movie's success. Now, Michael J. Fox was shorter than Eric Stoltz. So they also had to recast Marty's love interest. They replaced Melora Hardin with Claudia Wells and Michael J. Fox spent every weekday shooting family ties. And then they had a station wagon with a mattress in the back for him to sleep on as it drove him over to the Back to the Future set where they would shoot the film's nighttime exteriors. And then once they were done with that, he'd be driven back to the Family Ties set. They had to get all the Back to the Future daytime exteriors on the weekends. So just imagine when you rewatch these scenes and Michael J. Fox looks exhausted or exasperated or commits to faceplant pratfalls or rolling down hills or slick hood slides or when those eyelids just look heavy on lines like, I can roll. And since these reshoots were so costly, they had to save money in other ways, like confining the film's action to the Universal Backlot set, and right here, making this movie's opening shot a one-er in Doc's lab with a stand-in. Marty tours the town square in Act 1 so that we can compare the changes that happen in Act 2. The town square is a parking lot now, but we'll see in the 50s it was a grassy park. The storefronts show several businesses moving or going out of business. The cinema has turned into a church as the 80s saw the rise of the evangelical Christian right. Marty transfers from the truck to the Jeep as it rounds the square, just like he transfers from car to car while fleeing Biff later or uh, earlier. But it's not action star moves that he's using in this movie. It's a classic Bart Simpson bullshit that he does every day that just blows the minds of everyone in the 50s. Now, outside of the high school, some graffiti reads Lorraine Del Calvin, a nod to Lorraine in 1955 becoming obsessed with Calvin Klein. Strickland says, You're too much like your old man. Yeah, Strickland starts by telling Marty to stay away from Doc and ends by telling him he's as hopeless as George. This gives us Marty's want and his fear. His want to play music at a high school dance and his fear that he might end up like his dad. The music Marty's band, The Pinheads, plays is Huey Lewis and the News Power of Love, one of two songs that Huey wrote for this movie. On stage, the other guitarist Marty plays with is Michael J. Fox's guitar instructor, but Marty immediately shreds into a solo that just ruins the song, which is why the judge, who's a cameo by Huey Lewis himself, grumpily stops him. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud. Outside, Marty swats a branch. This is actually the same tree whose branch will snag the cable later or earlier. A tree that hates Marty McFly for all time. I assume one of the cousins of the Peabody Pine Tree getting revenge for his fallen brother. Marty shares his fears with Jennifer. What if they say, get out of here, kid? You got no future. Yes, he fears creative rejection, which is something he inherits from his father, but also buried in there is something deeper, the fear of having no future. And as we'll see at the end of the second act, Marty will both bomb on stage and face having his future erased. Marty and Jennifer get close Clock blocked. Save the clock tower. 30 years ago, lightning struck that clock tower and the clock hasn't run since. Yeah, it reads like a comedic distraction, but save the clock tower is exactly what Marty does by redirecting the lightning into the DeLorean. And we get key exposition along with a key prop in the form of that flyer that Jennifer writes her grandmother's number on the back of, leaving Marty with this kiss. That's the power of love. Yeah, behind Marty in this yoing moment, a freaking porn theater screening orgy American style. Back home, Biff bullies George, and you can actually hear the grease in George's hair. Hello? Hello, anybody home? Oh. Huh? Now, when the timeline warps at the end of the movie, George's hair is gray. That's the natural color his hair would go. So here, by greasing it, George is just trying to look younger. We're here in act one. Marty's dad ruins his weekend, and we see how George's weakness is a burden that Marty carries. And I'm afraid I'm just not very good at confrontations. I love how George clenches his fist as if wanting to deck Biff, but when he says the word confrontations, he releases it. Now in the next scene, Crispin Glover has a red scrape on his finger, making me wonder if George might have punched a wall in frustration, or maybe the actor just hit something to get in the character. Crispin Glover, kind of a weird dude. But there was something removed here. Notice the bowl of peanut brittle. This was actually from a deleted scene where a neighbor and his daughter pressure George into buying peanut brittle for a baseball team, knowing that he'll be a pushover. See, honey, I told you, we'd only have to go to one house. Lorraine dreamily and drunkly recalls how George kissed her at the dance. It was then that I realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. Oh, 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 oh. 
I love how the board game Life is strategically placed behind George as Lorraine feels stuck in her life with him. And of course, George is watching the rerun of The Honeymooners that Lorraine's family later watches the original airing of when Ralph dresses up as a spaceman, as Marty does to scare George. In the parking lot, Marty finds Doc's truck, which has a bumper sticker reading, One nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. Originally, this story was going to feature Marty driving into a nuclear test site back when the time machine was going to be a government invention and a refrigerator instead of a DeLorean. If this sounds familiar, it's because this movie's executive producer was Steven Spielberg, and he straight up used this idea of nuking the fridge in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. But using a DeLorean was equally silly in the 80s because sales for that car had been lagging and car maker John DeLorean was on the news every night for drug charges. That's really the inside joke when Marty struggles to start the car in the third act and why here he says, Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? It's funny not because the car was cool, it's because this car sucked. Doc sends his dog Einstein through time, and the fire tracks blast under their feet, and the unfinished VFX is always left in, even in all the remastered versions. I love this, because the editors of this film had only nine weeks to cut this whole film, which is insane. The reason why is that three weeks after they wrapped, they assembled a rough cut and screened it for test audiences, this is around mid-May 1985, and this test screening was so successful that Universal moved the release date up to July. 3rd. Now notice when Einstein returns, it's 1.21 a.m. 1.21 as in 1.21 gigawatts! Yes, Galen Zemeckis consulted with one expert who apparently pronounced it gigawatts, despite the correct pronunciation being gigawatts. But that's the thing about Back to the Future. Yes, there's a lot of goofy choices and goofy mistakes you might call them, but they embrace it all. And by doing so, it doesn't look like a mistake. It feels intentional. Now, when they were writing this movie, the best known time travel stories featured characters going back to the past and finding history set in stone, unchangeable. But when they were conceiving Back to the Future, they wanted to play with the idea that the past could be altered and could alter history therefore through the butterfly effect. Bob Gale cited the butterfly effect concept from Ray Bradbury's The Sound of Thunder. Now, on the new Rockstars channel, I identified the eight categories of time travel stories, and I called Back to the Future Type 1 or it time travel, in which all of time just kind of exists on one smushy timeline and changes to the past, just kind of echo forward through history and give you kind of these playful storybook endings. Now, the second Back to the Future film expands the logic into branch timelines, the multiverse logic that we see in movies like Avengers Endgame, but the first Back to the Future focuses less on time travel mechanics and instead just uses time travel to bring a son and father back together. That's really it. Despite how much we hear Doc Brown explain time travel to us, it's really not that confusing in this movie. We don't hear of anything like the grandfather paradox or the bootstrap paradox. There's no multiverse in it, but this is the time travel with the most dramatic stakes because we don't know what the future of the characters looks like. And because there's no multiverse, there's no disposability. If Marty gets erased from the timeline, he gets erased from existence. But overall, they keep it pretty simple. Like the time travel in this movie is the simple act of driving a car through your hometown and seeing how one block has moved on with time, but others have been frozen in time. And changes to the timeline are represented by the simple prop of a fading photograph. The way faces and photographs can fade from our memories over time. The one thing to futurize the technology in this movie is the fact that the time machine is powered by a nuclear reactor, which in a way makes Back to the Future a sort of veiled commentary about how the 80s nuclear brinkmanship took us geopolitically back to the 50s. So anyway, as Doc prepares to leave, he suddenly remembers, I almost forgot to bring extra plutonium. How did I ever expect to get back? One pellet, one trip. I must be out of my mind. One pellet, one trip. Key exposition. Also, those plutonium vials do look a lot like what Marvel would later use for pin particle vials in Avengers Endgame. You can really see the DNA of Back to the Future spread throughout all time travel cinema thereafter. And then the Libyans arrive. They shoot Doc and Marty flees. He accelerates and the needle gets close to 88, but then he turns and it drops back down. Michael J. Fox always has to keep his arms raised, which gives his steering an intensity, but really it was just because he was crammed in that driver's seat due to the bulky time circuit gear. And then Marty hits 88 miles per hour and Doc's body is immediately to his right as he passes, just as Doc's body will be on the ground when Marty hits 88 in 1955 in Act 3, and Marty instantly flashes to the Peabody farm in 1955. There are no glowing wormholes, just a flash of light, and instantly you're somewhere new. Zemeckis really worked hard to try to just keep this simple. The idea that when we drive from town to town, or just turn on the wrong street, it really feels like you've traveled through time. So onto the Peabody farm, which Doc Brown just kind of gave us a history of back in the parking lot. Mr. Peabody's son is named Sherman. The father and son named named after Sherman and Mr. Peabody, the time-traveling duo from the Rocky and Bullwinkle shorts. Sherman's comic is Space 
zombies from Pluto. So Spaceman from Pluto was actually proposed to be the title for this movie by Universal head Sid Scheinberg, but Steven Spielberg replied to his memo saying they thought this was a hilarious joke, so Scheinberg reportedly dropped the suggestion in shame. And as he leaves, Marty takes out one of Peabody's genetically bred pines, resulting in the mall back in 1985 warping from Twin Pines Mall to Lone Pine Mall. The billboard for Lion Estates shows a house with the same exact construction as the McFly family house, just painted seafoam instead of yellow, and Marty walks through the Hill Valley Town Square set to the Cordette's 1954 Mr. Sandman, painting all of this as a possible dream for Marty, which makes Michael J. Fox's sleep deprivation a happy accident. Now, in my theory that every American film is trying to either be The Wizard of Oz or Citizen Kane, a dream escape, or a puzzle mystery, Back to the Future is definitely Wizard of Oz. Doc is the wizard, and this moment is Dorothy entering the Technicolor world. Marty passes a sign for the movie Cattle Queen of Montana, a 1954 film starring Barbara Stanwyck and Ronald Reagan build second. I love that. Instead of a re-elect Mayor Goldie Wilson car, now it's re-elect Mayor Red Thomas. Red is actually that homeless guy at the end of the movie in the alter 1985. Lou makes fun of Marty's life preserver vest, and George is sitting facing away from us, dumping cereal in a bowl, echoing himself dumping peanut brittle earlier. We are now in Act 2. Marty befriends his dad, and unfortunately, Marty realizes his dad was a pervert. So behind Lorraine's romantic meet-cute legend is a horny, horny truth. Marty saves this pervert. Stella! Another one of these damn kids jumped in front of my car! He says, another one of these damn kids? Suggesting George might have jumped out in front of his car before. How many times have you done this, George? Now, with all the amazing shots in this movie, I think my single favorite shot is actually this simple one in the bedroom because the blocking is perfect. Michael J. Fox falls out of the bed. Lorraine's mom calls. Leah Thompson spins around. Lorraine jumps out of frame, tosses the jeans back to Marty from her hope chest. In the mirror, you can see Lorraine sneaking a peek, smiling, and then Michael J. Fox perfectly buttons this single take with a perfect and probably painful pratfall. Now, the deep dive is still a very young channel, and when new channels get started, it's hard to get people willing to sponsor us. And as we're talking about a movie with some adults who definitely didn't age all that well or really take care of their hair, I'm honestly super grateful to have Geology and their skin and hair care products sponsoring us today on the deep dive. Thank you so much. So Geology is a 16-time award-winning personalized skincare company recognized in Men's Health, Esquire, and Ask Men Grooming Awards with over 6,000 five-star reviews. You just take a quick 30-second diagnostic quiz and Geology is going to create a simple and effective skincare or hair care routine customized just for you with ingredients that are dermatologist tested, proven to work, and personalized to your needs. For hair care, Geology's got strengthening shampoo and conditioner co-wash, which will transform your routine and deliver the best hair of your life. It extends the time between washes and replaces the need for so many products. So you wash your hair and you save money. And when your lifelong bully knocks on your forehead saying, hello, hello, you're not going to hear any grease in those knocks. They also offer body washes and deodorants that are free of harsh ingredients and they smell great. Like for skin care, they have you covered from all angles. Fight acne, reduce oilness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother hydrated skin, and target those signs of aging, McFly! Their daily personalized skincare routine comes with two face washes, morning face cream, retinol night cream, eye cream! And right now for a limited time, you can get a five-piece trial set for only $15 if you use the code ROCKSTARS70 at checkout. That's over $50 of product for just $15. On top of that, you'll get an additional bonus offer on one of their brand new skin, hair, and body products of your choice when you add it to your trial. To get started, just click the link in the description. Thanks to Geology for sponsoring us, and back to the analysis. Marty meets Uncle Jailbird Joey. So you're my Uncle Joey. Better get used to these bars, kid. What? Yes, Joey wears black and white stripes, classic prisoner attire. So Marty meets 1955 Doc Brown, and he shows them a photo of him and his siblings. Already, the top of Dave's head is fading off. Now, does it make sense for history to slowly erase Dave from the top down, and then Linda, and then Marty over the course of a week in 1955, as opposed to just like all three disappearing at the same time, instantly the moment the timeline alters? I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it's more fun to watch it this way. Because again, this is not a time travel movie. It's not a list of rules spoken to each other by robots. This is a narrative about a boy and his dad and destiny popping them to each other. A skeptical doc asks who's president in 1985. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan? The actor? I suppose Jane Wyman is a first lady. Yes, Jane Wyman was Reagan's first wife and they divorced in 1949. Ronald Reagan had already remarried to Nancy David Reagan in 1952. But I like how this shows that Doc hasn't been keeping up with current events. He's really buried in his work. After Marty convinces Doc with the story of the flux capacitor, Doc marvels at the camcorder. No wonder your president has to be an actor. He's gotta look good on television. 
Yeah, Doc's right. Earlier, Lorraine's dad said, who the hell is John F. Kennedy? JFK didn't become a household name, at least here in California, until his debate against Richard Nixon, the first televised presidential debate, and Kennedy looked way better on camera. And a lot of historians attribute this one moment to Kennedy winning the election in 1960. That and his bootlegger dad buying a bunch of votes in Chicago. Similarly, Ronald Reagan was referred to as the communicator in chief. He used to be an actor, and as president, he was known for his telegenic charm. The Save the Clock Tower flyer comes back when Marty shows Doc Jennifer's note, and for the first time, Marty sees the other side of it. So that idea to use a bolt of lightning hits like a bolt of lightning. We're sending you back to the future. Doc points at the camera and then immediately he skews off. Christopher Lloyd does such a good job making Doc seem just a bit unhinged. And another ridiculous shot that I just noticed, as Marty and Doc approach the school, for no reason at all, they walk directly into the bike rack and awkwardly climb over the bikes. There's a lot of random physical humor in this movie in every shot. Now this redhead who puts the kick me sign on George is actually the same guy who cuts in on George and Lorraine's dance later. So it's not just Biff who's bullying George, it's his entire world. Now Zemeckis uses a recurring two shot of Marty and Doc. Marty in the foreground on the left, Doc on the right, pacing back and forth away from camera. We actually saw this earlier in the parking lot. Marty facing forward, focused only on the future, Doc zipping back and forth, thinking about the ramifications of time travel. There's actually similar framing with Marty and George in the backyard later, and there's some importance to this that I'll get to at the end of the video. Now, in the cafeteria, when Marty pulls Biff off Lorraine, notice how George is immediately gone from the table behind him. Anytime Biff begins to assault Lorraine, George runs away. Marty has to convince George, using a Walkman tape labeled Ed Edward Van Halen. Edward is written smaller above Van Halen, and that's because the band Van Halen didn't want to be associated with the movie, despite the fact that Eddie Van Halen recorded a guitar riff for it, so they had to write in Edward above Van Halen later. Wearing his yellow radiation suit, Marty has a hair dryer tucked into his waistband. Now, hair dryers like this did not exist in 1955. This is from Doc's suitcase, meaning that 1985 Doc wanted to be able to blow dry his hair wherever he went or whenever he went. There was actually a removed part of the scene where Marty points his hair dryer at George like a gun, threatens to melt his brain, which George recaps later to Marty. Meanwhile, 1955 Doc going through 1985 Doc's suitcase was another deleted scene where 1955 Doc finds a Playboy. Back at the diner, George works up some courage. Lou, give me a milk. Chocolate. Remember, earlier in the cafeteria, George had chocolate milk with his lunch. Now, he wants to finish what he was drinking when he left Lorraine out to dry before. Marty trips Biff, Biff rises, so that all we see are Marty's raised eyebrows. I love this shot. Thomas Wilson was significantly taller than Michael J. Fox, but notice when Marty punches him, the punch comes from a higher angle. That's because in the shot, this isn't Michael J. Fox. This is Eric Stoltz. It's one of the few shots of Stoltz that they kept in the film. Stoltz was closer to Wilson's height, and reportedly, Wilson didn't really like how physical Stoltz would get during their scenes, so by Keeping this in, they keep this raw physical anger between the actors. So Biff chases Marty around the town square, one of the best scenes of the film, and it's super economical. Again, all the action sequences of this movie really take place right here on this set. In this instance, if you track the cars around the set, they really just do two laps around the block. Even as one of the most iconic action movies, all of Back to the Future's locations are really in a suburban town. Exec producer Steven Spielberg borrows from Indiana Jones, which he also worked on a couple years earlier. Marty gets stuck on the front of the car, like Indy does in front of the Nazi truck and Raiders, but while Indy goes under the truck, Marty pulls an equally awesome move, running over the top of the car and landing on the skateboard. It's awesome, but it is a false victory. It's another example of Marty having to be the hero, inserting himself where history does not need him to, and it ultimately makes his mission even harder by creating an enemy. Doc uses a scale model of the town, and for the clock tower, Doc uses a wristwatch that he set to exactly 10.04, the time the lightning strikes. After Lorraine asks Marty to the dance, in the next scene, we see Marty with George doing laundry and Marty has a punching bag. This is actually connected to another deleted scene where Marty gives George boxing lessons and George struggles to punch with his right hand. It was going to be implied that George was left-handed, but like many left-handed kids who grew up in the 40s and 50s, he was forced to use his right hand unnaturally, which might be why he scribbles so awkwardly when he's writing his short story in the cafeteria. And so later in the movie, when George finally punches Biff, notice he does it with his left hand, which catches all of us, even himself, by surprise. Marty hints that he plans to make Lorraine uncomfortable. You mean you're going to go touch her on her... No. No, George. Yeah, George was holding his mother's bra, and Marty grabs the bra out of his hand, tosses it back into the basket, because Marty faces the reality that he's probably going to be having to deal with his mother's bra. On the night of, a cop asks Doc for a permit for his weather experiment, and we see Doc going through his wallet, but in a deleted scene, Doc was going to bribe that cop with cash. Again, it's the 50s. It's not as wholesome a time as we thought. Though, in a way, this is a weather experiment. Harnessing lightning the way one of Doc's inspirations, Benjamin Franklin, did with his kite in the key. Two arguably equally important technological moments. 
George's wristwatch is behind, as Marty's watch always seems to be off in this movie. George was supposed to punch Marty at exactly 8.55, but even if George was on time, it wouldn't have worked since Lorraine wanted Marty to make a move on her. Fate intervened to give time for Biff to get there. In a way, Fate was punishing Marty for creating an enemy in a way that he did not need to, but also is intervening in a way to make sure history gets righted on the correct path. We survived this Oedipal tension when Lorraine cosmically comes to her senses. But when I kiss you, it's like I'm kissing my brother. And Marty sighs in relief, but Biff, who remember earlier in this movie complained to George about the blind spot of a car, now appears exactly in Marty's blind spot to punish Marty for getting a little too victory lappy earlier. And in the sequels, the comics, the animated series, Biff becomes something of an eternal evil in the Back to the Future mythology who exists in incarnations throughout all of time. It's really all because Marty had to show off. And I love it. There's a solid bit of continuity here. Biff's upper lip is cut from when Marty punched him earlier. He is wounded and his gray and black bomber jacket makes him look like a great white shark with a taste of blood in his mouth. It is genuinely terrifying when Biff gets in the car with Lorraine the 50s, not so charming. It's also a time when a character named 3D uses a racial slur against Marvin Barry and the Starlighters, and another character named Skinhead calls them Reefer Addicts, all while the third crony, Match, Billy freaking Zane doesn't do anything to stop them. But again, George being late and in character ends up working out because for the first time, he finally speaks up to Biff. Hey, you, get your damn hands off. And just by starting to say this rehearsed scripted line, just having the words coming out of his mouth gives him enough courage to see this through. No, Biff. You leave her alone. And he gives Biff the left hook heard around the world. Now, this should be enough of a victory for Marty, right? But uh, 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 his photo still is not fixed because George hasn't really proven it yet. And Marty hasn't overcome his fears yet. Doc even signals that the worst is yet to come. The storm. He isn't just talking about the thunder above. On a meta level, he's also referring to Marty's greatest anxiety inside, having to play guitar at the school dance where he has a nervous breakdown and he feels physically his future being erased from existence. And it is painful. Sorry to compare to Marvel again, but the pain we see each of the Avengers getting dusted doesn't even come close to the pain Michael J. Fox shows on the stage. But that redhead cutting in was actually triggered by George's own insecurity. George, aren't you gonna kiss me? I, I don't know. George overcoming this proves that his confidence wasn't a fluke or a product of his anger at Biff, but he needed an inner self-respect to not let anyone f with him. But again, Marty still takes another victory lap and plays Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good, and the room loses their goddamn minds and becomes professional swing dancers. I mean, does anyone get paid to swing dance? Now, Zemeckis and Gale considered cutting the scene, but the test audience loved it so much that they wouldn't even dare. And thank God, because it is an amazing scene. Michael J. Fox does the Chuck Berry duck walk. It's just a lot of fun. And yes, we get the moment where Marty Marvin Barry calls his cousin Chuck to share with him that new sound he was looking for. And sure, you can snark over history being revised so that a white kid inspired a black rock and roll legend when historically it was definitely the opposite. There's white artists stealing from black artists. But that is the point of this joke. Marty only knows Johnny B. Good because he grew up listening to Chuck Berry. And Chuck Berry was totally fine with this joke being in the movie. But it also makes sense within the inner logic of the movie because seconds after Marvin holds out that phone, Marty gets carried away and shifts into the Van Halen solo. And the room grinds to a halt. They all hate it. So Chuck wouldn't have had that much time to hear the blues riff on the other end. To him, it just would have been distorted chaos. Really, all of Marty's big wins in the past are actually forgettable blips. But still, when the room freezes in confusion, you can see George in the middle of the crowd in the background still smiling supportively at Marty, a classic dad at a talent show, but now a dad who really supports creative endeavors. Doc and Marty argue about the letter. The consequences could be disastrous! Doc, that's a risk you're gonna have to take! I never thought about this before, but Zemeckis made Lloyd and Fox scream all of these lines, which is justified by the howling wind, but still, the effect is that it gives an otherwise pretty slow scene INSANE EMOTIONAL STAKES! What follows is just a perfectly edited and scored sequence. And I haven't talked enough about Alan Silvestri's epic score. Thanks, YouTube. Alan Silvestri, obviously an amazing composer who went on to compose the main Avengers theme for the Marvel Universe, but here is really his best work. Every beat of the sequence in the score hammers us with madcap tension. But most importantly, Silvestri deprives us of the full main theme you know, da 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 because it is not yet earned until he passes the finish line. Doc scales the scaffolding, the 
ledge breaks off, remember this all began with Doc slipping on a ledge, his toilet, to hit his head and conceive of the flux capacitor. And he circles back to that slipping now. What seems like a stumble is actually an important triumph. All of this is edited like the Star Wars trench run. Lots of things having to happen in sequence. We cut to a sweating pilot in the cockpit, mentally saying, stay on target, stay on target. Flashes of lightning like cannon towers. They get one shot at this. And Doc finally zip lines down and patches the timeline by using his own body as a conduit. He becomes part of the timeline that fixes the timeline. And finally, only here does Silvestri hit us with the da 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 and the DeLorean blasts to the future. That movie theater in the background is playing Mickey Rooney's The Atomic Kid, a movie in which a guy wanders into a radioactive test site and gets powers. Another nod to the original draft of having to drive into a nuclear blast, just as Marty effectively does here by driving into a cinema. After all of the noise we just heard, everything goes so quiet. And rather than following Marty into the future, we stay with Doc in the quiet, fixed 1955. We revel with him in his victory. And it's amazing to think that Doc will spend the next 30 years of his life building a time machine, burning down his family home, dealing with terrorists. All of this not out of reckless experimentation, but out of faded determination to close the loop of history. We're back in 1985. It's a great transition of Doc just looking up at the clock tower. We think we're still in 1955, but oh, here's a helicopter. And notice how the clock tower ledge remains broken. Former mayor Red Thomas is now homeless. Now Red is actually played by George Buck Flower, an adult film actor who starred in Orgy American Style that's playing at the theater now. And again, the Twin Pines Mall, now the Lone Pine Mall. History has changed and all these details make us feel more okay for Doc to have read the letter. Marty witnesses Doc being shot from a different angle. I love how his past self cuts off his no before he could say it, as if both Martys react to seeing Doc dead the same way. We learn that Doc taped together the letter and saved himself with a bulletproof vest. Well, I figured, what the hell? Yes, I love how this movie looks at its own time travel madness and says, nah. It. Because again, the time travel rules are not what this is about. Marty wakes up the next morning and on his wall is an enlarged version of his photo with Dave and Linda. Because nothing makes us feel better than seeing these three siblings together. We see how the McFly home is now nicer and Marty faints upon seeing George and Lorraine. Mom, Dad. What? Did you hit your head? Remember, Marty hitting his head on that street is what got him stuck in the love triangle with his parents. Biff went from wrecking George's car to waxing it. George's novel arrives, a match made in space. George fictionalizing what he went through with Marty in 1955. Now, if it's his first novel, how do they have this nice house? I assume that George had published a bunch of short stories and this is just his first full novel. And George says, Like I've always told you, you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. So it would seem here that in act three, Marty has saved his dad. But Hold up, this isn't right. Because George is kind of a prick, yeah? In fact, the reason Crispin Glover didn't return for the sequels is that he hated how George McFly became a stereotypical 80s materialistic yuppie. But Doc returns in the future because their time stream has been disrupted by their actions. What, we become assholes or something? No, 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 Marty. It's your kids, Marty. Something has gotta be done about your kids. This movie totally knows that it's kind of gross that the McFlys end up rich and materialistic with Marty randomly rewarded with the truck he wanted at the beginning of the movie. That is why Doc storms back in to disrupt the storybook ending. The supposed moral of the movie, the wisdom George just spoke, was actually a line he stole from Marty in 1955. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. But we actually first heard this line in the opening minutes of the movie. It's like Doc Yeah, I know, saying. I know. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Yes. This immortal wisdom came from Doc. At the beginning of all this, I said this movie was a story of a son saving his father. But what exactly does that have to do with the mystery of Marty's friendship with Doc? Well, there is a reason we feel so unsatisfied with George McFly at the end of this movie. It's because George wasn't the father Marty really saved. Doc was. That is why this movie pairs George and Doc in parallel shot composition, but the two characters never actually meet. After years of being asked why Doc and Marty are friends, screenwriter Bob Gale finally started to talk about this, and he said that in addition to the comic book origin, Doc represents Marty's rebel spirit as a cool dad. Well, when I was growing up in uh, in St. Louis, I was, I don't know, eight or nine years old. My next door neighbor was a professional photographer, and he had a dark room in his basement. And he invited myself and my two brothers to come over uh, one evening uh, to show us how film is developed. And this guy had all this really cool equipment in his basement. And he was, as far as you know, I was concerned, he was a real Doc Brown. I don't think he and his wife had any kids. So maybe he looked up on me and his, my brothers as 
as as sort of surrogate kids. Yeah, as kids, we are drawn to quirky wizards in our lives to guide us through the unknown. And Dr. Emmett Brown is Marty's true father figure in this movie. And like Marty's photograph, our images work to reflect this new timeline. It was Doc who ruined Marty's weekend by getting him embroiled with Libyan terrorists that chase him back in time. Doc was the dad dad daddy-o Marty gets to know the best in 1955. And Doc is the papa that Marty saves. Back to the Future's ending is perfect in its escapism because Doc and Marty never felt at home in this 1985. The out of time license plate has been replaced with a futury mirror barcode and Doc says, Where we're going, we don't need roads. I love it. There is a compass on the dash since Doc needs a way to orient himself in the air. Now, To Be Continued was not in the original theatrical release because this was not intended to be a trilogy at first. Gail and Zemeckis have said otherwise they wouldn't have had Jennifer get in the car just to sideline her in part two and three. To Be Continued was added for the home video release in the TV airings. And so I just love to imagine Back to the Future ending on this thrilling cliffhanger with nothing to follow. The DeLorean blasts directly at us and we are left like Doc and Marty with our feet in the fire trails. A father and son having saved each other, escaping the moral decay of the 1980s suburbia to a roadless future that we can only imagine. These timeless heroes go back to where they belong, Back to the Future. I loved diving into Back to the Future with you all. And again, please support us by grabbing some deep dive merch at nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to the deep dive, turn notifications on, and share this channel and its videos with everyone you know. Follow me at EA Boss. Thanks for watching, buttheads.